And that's where I want to bring in our co-host, Jeff Small, along with our guest, Peter Morisi. Peter is a professor at the Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. He's also a former chief economist at the U.S. International Trade Commission. And you could follow Peter on Twitter at pmorisi1. Peter, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be with you guys. You know, I don't, you probably remember this, but two, three years ago, uh, we had an interview on television where I started to ask you about how to tie a bow tie. And we had some fun with that, but I've got to tell you, with what's going on right now in the economy and the stock market, we have far more important things to talk about than bow ties. So what do you think is going to happen economically in the second quarter, right? First quarter numbers, the GDP was down almost 5%. We're opening up, most states are opening up mid-second quarter. So how do you think second quarter is going to look from an economic standpoint? The numbers are going to be shocking and disturbing, simply because we have 40 million people who filed for unemployment. So you figure the average unemployment rate in, in, the, in, the, in the next quarter has got to be measured and unmeasured, because some of it's getting missed, around 25%. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'll get worse and then it'll get better, but it's going to average 20 to 25%, which means that GDP should be down, you know, at least 15 percent on a on a quarterly basis. So annualize that, and you're up around 60, and it, the number could be bigger. But you shouldn't take it too seriously. The question is, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Peter. Did you say 15 or 50? No, no. F the the actual the actual decline will be 15, 20 percent. Got it. So the annualized rate. The way we publish these things, what is, you know, if we did this for four quarters in a row, what would it be? That would come out to 60 or sure, so, sure. 60 to 80. So you shouldn't take that number. I mean, that's going to be a bad day in the market. Yeah. You know, it's just going to be, everybody's going to have at least for an hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then everybody will sober up and realize that was forecasted. The question is, where are we come October, November? Right. How are we third quarter? How are we fourth quarter? Exactly. Yeah, right. So are we going to, you know, are, are we going to be able to gain back that 25% in the last two quarters? Are we going to be able to gain back half of that? I, I know it's a kind of a guess to some degree because it depends upon the, the virus, but you tell me what you're thinking at this point. Okay, suppose that there's no, vi there's no second wave. Mm -hmm. Then by the end of the year, we should be recovered or into, into the winter, we should be recovered to about where we're going to recover to. And that won't be 100%. I mean, a lot of places have closed permanently not just restaurants, but some small manufacturers and so forth. So that means probably we're going to start from a base where the economy is about 10% smaller. And now, to tie it into what we'll talk about later, the stock market is about 10% off of the beginning of the year and a lot more than that off of its February peak. What that means is we probably have some room to continue to go up this year but we shouldn't expect to get back to the February peak until, you know, next year. We can talk more about that later. Now, well, and I know Jeff's chomping at the bit to talk to you about the stock market. So, uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Hey, Peter, Jeff here. Hey, listen, you know, the last 10 years are going to be nothing like the next 10 years. And earlier before the pandemic hit, people like Robert Schiller, people you know, Warren Buffett, we're having a very negative view on what the rate of return was going to be on the S&P for the next 10 years. So for longer term investors who are looking out 10 years beyond the pandemic, where do you see the actual rate of return going on the S&P 500 on an annualized basis? Well, the S&P 500, the price earnings ratio is the, you know, is the inverse of the, of the earnings price ratio, obviously. And let's compare that to bonds. When bonds are really cheap, and the issue here is that bonds are going to stay cheap no matter how well the U.S. economy does because there's such an excess supply of savings in the world. China's such a risky place for asset for portfolio investments. And Europe, frankly, can't get its act together. With that in mind, uh, the, S the, the, the sustainable S&P price ratio, the, the average, the 10-year the, 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 the moving average, the 20-year moving average, the 50-year moving average, whichever you want, has been trending up. And so the 23 that we accomplished in February maybe was a price to perfection, but it was sustainable in terms of the long-term trends. So my feeling is once we get back to normal, the economy is 10% smaller. Getting back up around 22, 23 is just fine. Remember, large companies are going to do better in the recovery than small companies. The small companies, the, the companies that are not uh, that are below mid-cap, 
and those that are not incorporated or sell on the exchange at all or whatever, they're the ones that are taking the hit. So my feeling is we're in an era of big companies because of global markets. Globalization is not going away. So the kinds of numbers and analysis we used, uh, uh, you know, before the crash will apply again. As for my friend at the University of Pennsylvania, my question for you is, do you ever recall him being optimistic about housing or asset prices? Uh, very rarely, actually. So. Very rarely. <laughs> now, if you had used him for your investment advisor, where do you think you'd be relative if you had used David? Well, you wouldn't have the same return, that's for sure. Or Peter. me. That's correct. Okay, so I think that you should consider that. You know, they give Nobel Prizes out for lots of reasons. Most of them are not for real market savvy. If you want an example, just read Paul Krugman every Sunday in the New York Times. Very true. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So I get it. You think uh, third quarter and fourth quarter will regain actually probably uh, two thirds of the economic shrinkage we've seen first and second quarter. Uh, but the stock market can still have potential to grow next several years. So we need to take a quick break. We'll be back in a minute, coming up right here on the Income Generation. We'll be right back. For now, let's bring in back in co-host Jeff Small, along with economist and author Peter Morisi, whom you can follow at Twitter at pmorisi one Peter, thanks for sticking around. Oh, nice to be with you again. So, hey, so this, this whole issue about uh, maybe having a two-thirds recovery between now and the end of the year, uh, is that what you were referring to when you wrote the article about a kind of a, a truncated V-shaped recovery? Yeah, I mean, it's going to bounce back, and it'll bounce back quickly, but it's not going to bounce back to the several level, same level. Now, one of the things to understand, when you're engaged in events that are much further from the mean than your historical record. You know, we haven't seen unemployment rates like this since 1920, 1933. Yeah. The quality of economic modeling becomes very, very dicey. Essentially, your 95% confidence interval becomes much, much broader. It's one of the things you learn first semester graduate econometrics that we even have a little graph for it, right. you know? Like, you know, when you're way out there, when you're way out there in a limb, uh, don't saw yourself off. So, you know, the difference between saying two thirds and three quarters is kind of like saying, who do you think is going to be in the World Series next year? And the right, answer is, right. it's, it's, it's really an awful. Yeah. Well, when I, when I see, when I hear two thirds, I, yeah, when I hear two thirds, I think half to three quarters. And I think with that, with that, with that big if, you put a disclaimer on it that we don't have a second round of significant Infection. The other hand, in, in, now you know why economists have two hands. That's right. That's right. Because we right. can't control things like viruses. That's right. Now the th thing to remember is that viruses usually do have an echo effect. There's usually a second wave, mm -hmm. and it really doesn't mean that the economy isn't going to bounce back as much as three quarters. But it really comes down to: Are we willing to then suffer through the second wave? as opposed to repeating what we just did. And I would suggest that in most places that would be foolish. You know, let's face it. Do you think there's many people on the island of Manhattan or in Westchester County that have not been exposed? Yeah, yeah, no, a lot of, a lot of people have, and a lot of people have developed immunity. We just, we just don't have the ability to test everybody yet. That's the real issue. But I, 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 want, I want to ask you something, what you said to Jeff, though, about the stock market. Uh, you know, you, you talked about a 7%, maybe average growth rate, per annum over the next 10 years. Is part of that because of the low interest rate environment that we're in right now? No, I think that the lo low interest rate environment gets us to 23, 25, 27 on the price earnings ratio. But once you get there, that's your adjustment for that. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 again, we're, we're well outside what we normally experience in America. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, you know, doing, um, Price, uh, you know, price earnings ratios back 50 years against interest rates 50 years is only going to give you a broad indication. But we're going to get to some sort of price to perfection again, you know, mm -hmm. well priced number. And then from there, it's 7%. The, the trick here is that in order to do really well on the market, it's easy to say, well, you know, you got to go to high tech. 
Well, at some point, high tech gets priced to perfection and it's 7%. Sure, sure. The, the trick here is to, to pick up those stocks that have been undervalued because they are going to have some bounce. Like, you know, say in the cruise line business, not everybody is carnival. You know, it's, it's really hard for me to understand how you can make a carnival boat safe. But there are yeah. other cruise lines that, that, that are, operate smaller boats that are able to deal with this better. So, you know, there's an example. And the other thing is picking off people in, in, in um, artificial intelligence, robotics, mm -hmm. things like that. Sure. Uh, picking off real estate in Manhattan. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, let's face it. Right now, they're all panicking in New York. The banks are going to open up. Uh, they're going to spread out. They're going to move to New Jersey and Long Island. I would move to New Jersey because it's got lower taxes. But they're going to move away. But the point is, the logic of Manhattan comes back when the virus is tamed. I mean, do you really want people spread all over the place? No, so I probably know. Manhattan real estate is going to get a bigger hit. The real estate investment trusts are getting bigger hits right now than they're going to sustain. And of no. course, that takes good, strong investment. Okay. Now, now, Jeff, uh, why don't you bring it back to our, our viewers? What you know, uh, with what we need well, to if know. Well, if from I'm a Peter viewer. About yeah, if I'm a viewer, Peter, I'm saying, wow, you are really optimistic um, about the future financially. You know, even though you're using history as the barometer for that, if I'm a viewer, this is what I'm saying. This isn't me speaking, Peter. But the reality is the uh, evidence-based science says that there will be multiple surges of the virus. And we know in the Spanish flu, under the second surge is when we saw the Dow really start to decline and go into a long-term protracted correction. Um, you know, there's a really good chance we're going to have a second surge, and most of that will be caused by people making mistakes and not safeguarding enough because this is a very highly transmissible, um, you know, virus. If you're an older person over 60 and you're retired and you're not going back to work, under the short term, what type of risks do you think they're facing if they're stock based at this time in those scenarios, Peter? They're very vulnerable because they haven't prepared themselves correctly. Uh, and so the best they can do is to shift to uh, dividend stocks so they can catch the rebound if they get it. And they, uh, you know, they'll be still get their dividends. Even, you know, let's face it, Procter & Gamble ain't going out of business. Uh, you know, so go to di dividend based stocks and, and write it out. Would a mind, would an eye towards the fact that, say, the petroleum industry's uh, long term uh, prospects are not great? So you certainly want to go to dividend-based stocks that have good long-term prospects for when the economy recovers. It, it's too late to jump into bonds because bonds can only have downside risk now. I mean, I really doubt that America is going to negative interest rates. They have more options over there than they admit. So, you know, that's, that's where I come on that. Hopefully, if you're an older person like myself, you're like myself, and I have my half of my money. In, in fixed income, cash equivalent, get out money so I can write out 10 years. Because wow. we may be looking at a long haul here, like you described, that you can, I cannot dismiss your scenario. Yeah, no, that makes sense, Peter. It's, uh, you're right, and, and whenever you, you know, I always tell people, you know, when you invest for the I instead of the G, the income instead of the growth, at least you have a bird in the hand, you're getting some component sent to you on a regular basis, and it just makes things uh, a lot more secure. And that's why I always love, it, love having you back on the show because you always, as smart as you are, you always have a, a nice, down-to-earth, common-sense way of looking at things. So, Peter, thanks so much for being back with us. We appreciate it. And you look great without your glasses, by the way. It's a new look. We, we love it here on The Income Generation. And you stay with us. We'll be back in a moment here on The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and I'm here with Jeff Small. We'll be right back.